Hey, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining. If you haven't figured out, we're having technical difficulties. Um, we have had John on, then we lost John, then we've had John on, then we've lost John. Um, so he will be on shortly. I am not John Hope Bryant. If you guys haven't figured that out, I'm Sam Mall with 11FS, the Managing Director for them for North America. However, I know John really well. We're good friends. Um, I think at 11FS, we've now done three interviews at least with John. We try to do one a year because in all honesty, 45 minutes with John is all you need for one year. <laughs> he's, he is that, he's that good. Um, and John is back. I am live. Um, I'm not sure, hey folks that are texting or, or putting messages in, let me know if you can hear John speaking. Um, this, if anything represents what we're going through globally right now with COVID, there he is. Oh, you look beautiful, John. If there's anything that represents what it's like with COVID, look, government's trying to um, uh, uh, move forward quickly, you know, fly the plane, retrofit the plane, gas the plane, you name it. It's even trying to set up for something on LinkedIn Live. Um, you know, John initially um, came in on a, on a um, I think in his iPad, and then we asked him if he could switch the computer. He got his Mac out. The Mac was only charged at 1%. So again, and my trackpad on my damn Mac is broke. So I had to break social distancing last night and go to Target to get me a, uh, <laughs> to get me something that I could do this with. So if you don't think I'm frustrated at this point. Anyways, John, I love you, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, God is good. Even, even our problems are high class problems. Yeah, that's a great way to put that. I love that. Um, you know, it, it, this is exactly what you make of it, right? Um, yeah, it is what most, it is. Most of life, as you well know, is what you make of it. <laughs> yep. Uh, there, we have a saying in the military, uh, you embrace the suck. And uh, I've been telling my kids that over and over again. You know, this yeah. is the time you make the most of it. So my daughter's getting ready to go off to college. So I'm like, find scholarships, baby. Um, you know, get ready. And she's she's done a great job. For those that have watched these um, since we started doing them, you might notice my background is different. That's because I am, as I promised, broadcasting live from my 17-year-old daughter's bedroom. So yes, that is an Arctic Monkeys poster behind me. I think there's a green day next to it. This is where the router is in my house. And John, my uh, my speed, my download and upload speed here in Florida is pathetic. So that's why I'm oh, thank you. You always look good. Yeah. All right, everybody. Um, please grab a cup of coffee, smack the like button, share this with your friends. We're going to jump in. We're going to take 25 minutes with John and we're just going to hammer through this. OK, and I will probably get about one question out there. If you have <laughs> questions. I love you, John. If you have. And that was probably I everybody in the room. I John that remark. <laughs> um, yeah, somewhere John's wife is just dying laughing at the comment. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the 15th episode of FinTech Inside of the Breakfast Show US show from 11FS bringing you the interesting insights into FinTech and banking landscape. Again, I'm Sam. You all know that today. Um, I. Like I said, I, I get to talk with John in depth about once a year. And uh, usually we go for like an hour. I'm not going to do that to everybody. But John is a serial entrepreneur. Um, he's been an advisor to at least four presidential um, um, or four, four folks. Uh, I think it was um, President. Four folks. <laughs> four folks. Yeah, four folks. I mean, President yeah. uh, Bush Sr., right? Clinton, Obama, and Bush Jr. Um, served as an advisor for all of them. Serial entrepreneur, you have Operation Hope, you have Promise Homes. We'll talk about all that. Um, on MSNBC, it feels like all the time. Last week, um, but just a, a good all around guy. How's that, John? How's that for a description for you? Well, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're so cool, Sam. We've, we, had a, we had a committee meeting in the black community and we made you an honorary black man. Yeah, my aunt would be proud. Um, my aunt Mamie, hey, Mamie, who's writing this out in Texas. Love her and bless her heart. Um, so really what I want to dive into, we've been talking about the impact of COVID on small businesses and consumer. And I really want to focus in on small business, John, because I've been watching you on television quite a bit lately on the on the cable talk shows talking about PPP and especially the impact to the minority business owners in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and so I'm actually I'm going to tee you up and say you are a minority business owner. Multiple really? businesses here in the U.S. Really? I, actually, I would call you. What would I call you, John? I tried to get John to run for office, and he wouldn't do it. And do you remember what you told me, John? Why won't you run for office, political? Well, office? I, uh, I was told 
So supposedly I said when I was 18, I don't remember it. Supposedly I was told as 18, if I keep my nose clean and all that stuff and, uh, you know, I could be president of the United States. Supposedly I said that wasn't enough power for me. Supposedly. I don't remember that. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine myself saying, because that's, to me, it's a very arrogant, <laughs> obnoxious thing to say. Um, but I can re- imagine myself saying it wasn't enough influence that, you know, power is the absolute ability to tell you what to do. And you got to do it basically whether you whether you want to or not. I've got some dominance over you, but to influence you, I've got to I've got to change the way you see a thing. I've got to uh, I've got to collaborate with your consciousness, your mind, your soul, your spirit. I've got to inspire you to want to do something differently. And I, I'd much rather inspire than to force. And um, I think that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, and a range of other heroes and sheroes from our history going back to Jesus and a range of others, the Jewish faith, uh, the uh, uh, you know Hindu, Muslim, I mean, all of the, uh, uh, the faiths and religions around the world have that one thing in common that they inspired you to be, they inspired your better angels. And um, I think inspiration changes generations, um, but power lasts as long as the position uh, holds. And We've had 45 presidents. How many can you actually remember? Don't even talk about how many U.S. senators we've had, uh, how many mayors we've had, uh, how many, you know, you go down to city council people, all that kind of stuff. You don't remember them, even though they pounded you with, you know, tens of millions of dollars worth of advertising space. And they've hit you over the head every two seconds with their name. Do you remember them? I just think that that people are not as dumb as <laughs> as politicians want to make them to be. I think that we're pretty smart, we're pretty wise, we're pretty insightful, we're pretty thoughtful. And power is uh, is an easy grab, but influence is uh, is the higher mountain. It's the light on the hill. And I've, I, I think that, that I'm a relay racer. And my relay race is to grab the baton from, uh, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, when he was assassinated, pursuing the Poor People's Campaign on a, on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, with my mentor, Ambassador Andrew Young, which was about eradicating poverty for all people, not black people, but 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 white, black, red, brown, and yellow. He realized there's more poor whites in America back then and now than poor anybody else. Still today, the case today, and that's what's in part driving the political division that we see today is the darkness, the the the, the anger, the frustration of my poor white brothers and sisters has been stoked. Um, by charismatic uh, leaders who have pulled up their frustrations and put them on the kitchen uh, table for dinner. And I think that we have got to find a better way to live than to build up walls. And I think it's it's building bridges. And, um, and so you've got Dr. King, you've got uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, March 3rd, 1865, after the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, you know, so noble, actually, a country went to war to set people free. Uh, now, it wasn't just a moral act. It was also an economic act because northern leaders realized that the southern economic model wouldn't last. And, and Europe is smart enough to get out of the slave business in the early 1800s. Um, and America, of course, trundled on because we were making so much dang on money from cotton. Uh, but Abraham Lincoln created a bank to tr- teach free slaves about money. Uh, his last act of noble uh, visionary leadership, the Freedmen's Bank. You know this story, Sam, very well. 1865, March 3rd, and uh, charter to teach free slaves about money and bring it in the free enterprise system. The last act of democracy, because we live in a, in a, in a free enterprise democracy, and and, uh, and he was killed the next month. So I, I think that 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 is really uh, uh, the most obvious thing we need to do for my poor white friends who came from Europe as indentured servants, for my Native American Indian friends who whose land was taken from them, for my, my poor struggling black friends who can't seem to find their footing when they're in a world where confidence and self-esteem is at a premium and theirs was robbed from them. And now my middle class white friends who are going through COVID-19 and who got too much month at the end of their money and are watching your program going, how could this happen to me? I did everything right. I went to school. I, I saved my money. I was respectful to my elders. I, I, I obeyed the law. I was, you know, I I, I did every. I have a. Ch- I, I, you know, I raised my children. We have a mom and dad at home. I did everything right. How could I end up in this spot? Because our economy was built on the, on on a, on a foundation of fragile eggs, and our leaders 
um, won battles but did not win wars. And, um, and I think there's a reset coming, not a reboot. So I want people to be hopeful, Sam. But there's a reset on the other side of COVID globally. Um, you know, your 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 this podcast is headquartered in London. It's happening in the UK, just like it's happening in the US, just like it's happening in Europe. This is a, a global reset of our virtues and our values, and a chance for us to get it right again, or shall I say, right first time, uh, to build a, an economy and a society that's actually sustainable. And um, that's what Sam means, by the way. You can't get a word edgewise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for all y'all, this is a very southern thing because uh, I know John. John's originally from LA, Compton, right, John? But yeah, um, he's lived in the South long enough. He lives in Atlanta, so he and I. I'm originally from Detroit, so but I've lived in the South. I'm married to a good uh, Southern woman from South Georgia. Um, we call this going to church. So in other <laughs> words, I get to ask two questions <laughs> and then dodge out of the way. Here's, here's the answer that John gave me one time when I asked him that question. I'm like, John, why don't you run for politics? And and he gave me a great summary, like you just said. You really do believe you can do more from the private sector now, the, the way that we're set up, right? I mean, you looked right at me and you said, name a black Bill Gates. Hmm. And I stared back at you and I'm like, uh, you know, name name a, a a black Tim Cook, right? You're gonna you're gonna name Oprah. You're gonna name um, oh, what's the Daisy. company? Yeah, what's the company out of uh, St. Louis? I can't remember. Um, but you, you get outside of that, yeah, Jay Z, uh, maybe LeBron. Um, you, you start to struggle, right? And you looked right at me and said, "I can do more from the private sector. I can I can hire more people, influence more people's lives, help them out um, from the private sector." And you really do believe that? Well, also, you know, look, Jay, uh, uh, look, Oprah gave us an award, gave yeah. us some money. For our movement, I, I, I admire, respect, uh, idolize even what Oprah has done. Because of her, I met Gail King, and Gail King, you know, featured a, on yeah. our show even last what, last week. Um, so that relationship capital strong. But but Oprah's met, you know, can employ tens of thousands. Um, Oprah Oprah Inc. employs my guess a few hundred. Fantastic. But what, what, what if you're trying to employ forty million black people? Forget about the poor whites and the struggling everybody else. You know, 150 million people trying to find a job in this economy. Um, certainly, right now, 30 million people looking for yeah. employment again. But but you have 40 million black people who are always looking for a way up. Jay Z Jay Z Enterprises. I don't know, 100 people maybe, 150 people, because they're a tied to an identity. It's their product is an individual brand. So it's all good, but it's not scalable. Yeah. You, you need a technology and industry. You know, what's a third of this economy? Real estate. <laughs> you know, what's another third? You know, financial services, right? You know, what's another third? I'm, I'm giving you broad numbers. You know, health and wellness, healthcare, medical healthcare. You know, three fourths of this economy it, uh, is not where black folks, uh, uh, as one segment of this example in this interview, get their employment. We are, we have built brands, we have mastered culture, art, arts, culture includes music, entertainment. It's called arts and culture, and we've mastered professional sports. But these are not areas where you have, you know, broad-based game, gainful employment. And uh, and I, in a, you know, we got fifty billion dollar industries called music, fifty billion. That's all genres of music in an economy that's almost twenty trillion. You know, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. But where the here's the good news, Sam: where the rules are published and the playing field is level, we succeed. Where the rules are published and the playing field is level, we kill it. And that's what Abraham Lincoln knew in 1865 when he when he offered us land. Uh, that was Food Action 15, January 1865. Union soldiers uh, got land for fighting the Union cause. Worked it so hard, they said, "My God, they're so industrious. Give them a mule." That was February. The next month, you know, no Twitter, no Instagram, no Facebook, no no technology like this. And somehow the memo got around that that, that blacks uh, were so industrious that they should be invested in. And then the next month came the bank, and the next month he was killed. What would have happened, Sam, that we were unleashed into the American ecosystem, not as free uh, indentured, uh, no, not even indentured slaves, as, 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 uh, as enslaved people, but, but in other words, we were not getting the benefit of our own labor. This is my next book, Up From Nothing, it comes out in October. We were not, we were robbed of our, what's the, the fundamental nature of free enterprise and capitalism? I'm gonna work and get the benefit of my labor. That, that's, a, I mean, when you guys do your podcast, Hopefully you're profitable at the end of the year, 
you did, you, hopefully you divvy up some profits or you have shareholder value, what, however you calculate it. But the principles put money in and put hard work in. You put hard work in. As a result of that, you get salary or you get bonuses or whatever or stock. Well, blacks were, were robbed of that. It was a reverse asset transfer. Reverse. We put in all the work. And somebody else got paid. The word millionaire, uh, the word millionaire came from 1850. Uh, and what happened in 1850? The, the richest city in the world per capita was Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez, Mississippi. The slave capital for what for for what was called white gold, cotton. So so all I'm saying is that that black folks had a chance to have an incredible economic lift, and it was robbed of them. And right now, if you're an American citizen, or you're a, a British citizen, or you're a you know, where, almost wherever you are in the world, you probably feel like the opportunities for your aspiration, your children, is being robbed from you because right now you you're doing all the stuff right, but you're not getting the uplift that you see at the top of the pyramid. And maybe Sam, the lesson here is that we've we've got to treat each other as we treat treat others as we want to treat ourselves. It, it's a, it's really fundamental. It's almost a biblical treat. Political division on the rise. It became a cottage industry. Racial tensions on the rise. My Jewish friends dealing with the same crap today they're dealing with in 1945 in many cases. Um, you know, we're ignoring our environment. Uh, and I think that uh, the man, <laughs> uh, the man hit the reset button. We, you aren't solving your own problems. Let me help you. I'm not going to wipe you out. I'm not going to reboot you, but I'm going to reset you. And and let you, let you figure this out again because all legitimate wealth comes from the bottom of the pyramid. Poor people create wealth and opportunity, uh, and that just wasn't happening anymore. And so I want to give hope to your viewers and your listeners that there's a shot for you in this new economy. There's a shot for you in uh, for your children um, to build wealth, to do well, do good, uh, to participate in the upward mobility uh, of our world um, on the other side of COVID-19. You know, and this is a good question, Amanda Moore. Uh, she has, she's an MBA candidate right now, and she keeps asking really good questions, and I like this one. Could you touched on it. You know, what do you mean by a sustainable economy, and how would it react to COVID-19? And you just made the point of kind of that bottom-up side of this, and you've talked about it quite a few times, right? Can, can you touch on that, if you don't mind? Yeah, so people say, well, John, should the government mandate, you know, a minimum wage? I, I don't I think it's the wrong approach. I think that 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 the free enterprise system should should see the enlightened self-interest of a living wage. If if you have people who can't afford to do anything other than pay rent and pay a car note and pay basic pay basic groceries, um, first of all, they can't. Let's be let's let's speak to rich people's pockets. If I'm a shareholder in in uh, refrigerator companies and microwave companies and car companies and all that stuff, as what the wealthy are. Who's going to buy your Who's going to buy your products? You need people who are making enough to go to dinner once or twice a week to keep the restaurants open, uh, for which the wealthier shareholders in to, make, to buy a car every three, four, or five years to, um, to to send their kids to college. I mean, public education became a private asset uh, as one huge wrong here that we got we really got wrong. Um, we have not set up the bottom of the pyramid uh, and, and to, to be aspirational. We we need a new Marshall Plan in many ways. When folks came back from World War II, and soldiers came back from World War II, they got a, a mortgage to buy a house, Sam, that got as much education as you can shove down your throat, <laughs> and you got an apprenticeship for uh, for a job for the future. And that created what we now call the, the middle class. You think about it. Uh, we haven't done that in you know uh, 70 years. Uh, I I propose to this White House um, a new, and they're listening, a, a new Marshall Plan. Um, that reinvest in the people at the bottom and the middle of this pyramid to get them out of surviving mode into thriving mode and, and to get a few of them to believe like you that they are winners so they, that we can create outsized opportunity at the top of the pyramid. You got surviving, thriving, and winning. That's the mentality. And, and the reason America has been so incredible is you had a lot of people who came here or who were here with a winning mentality. They knew they were winners before they even won anything. And you got too many people now who've lost hope who don't believe you work hard, play by the rules, do the right things, that this will sustain you, that that the success will be there for you, that you've got bifurcated. Even this recovery on the other side of COVID right now is going to be uh, bifurcated. 
You'll have an yeah. L at the bottom if we don't do something. That's the poor people, 40% of people on an hourly wage of all races. And then you've got the wealth, me and you, those who do well, who are going to have a U-shaped uh, soft recovery because you have $6 trillion of stimulus going to be in the economy. Um, plus, all of us are tired of hanging around our family who we love and are going to, going to find it a national pastime and a national uh, a patriotic duty to go shopping <laughs> as soon as yep. all clear is posted. And we're going to restaurants, malls, getting on airplanes, going to hotels, and that's going to create a recovery. So the young lady's question is right on, is everything from looking at a living wage and how that's good for the economy, is good for our sustainability, because right now, we're too fragile. We can't go, obviously, four weeks without a, without a paycheck before everything blows up. Hello. I mean, Sam, that's what you and I have been talking about on this program for three years. The average person in the UK and America has doesn't have $40 for an unplanned event. 70% of the economy is living from paycheck to paycheck. And no one's teaching us financial literacy. Let's just start there. Financial literacy is a new civil rights issue. The, 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 the parliament in the UK and American government, Congress, should make financial literacy on the other side is a, a human right. Let's start with that as a baseline of a sustainable economy. You wouldn't want somebody on the road driving a car without a driver's license. Man, you just you just answered a great question that Sidrahar, um, who, by the way, every damn show has asked a great question. And and you touched on this. And and Sidrahar, I tell you, go out and look at some of the books that John's written. How many books you written now, John? Six, seven? Uh, my, this, uh, well, technically, this is my the one that's coming out now is my fifth, but I've you know written thousands of articles. Okay. So there you go. So video views on yeah, I actually I actually took one of his books. Um, it was the memo and gave it to my daughter, my 17-year-old daughter. She used it this. She used yeah. it at the doorstop, Sam. Yeah. So I said, read this, and she did. So here, here's Sidderhar's question. You touched on this, but I really want to dive a little bit deeper into it real quick. He said, is the lack of financial literacy a major cause of generational poverty, or is it more structural inequality, you know, education, hiring, tax codes, et cetera? Um, is a lack of financial literacy structural or generational? Is that the question? Yeah, causing generational poverty. It, it, well, it's yeah. both. It, it's both. I agree. I mean, yeah, I it's structural because we, we, uh, we've known that the wealthy... So the reason that Junior Achievement was created uh, 120 years ago was agrarian father farmers who owned real estate and owned the business, they, they were the small business owners of that day, uh, knew that public education wasn't teaching their children how to run a business. So they created, hello, Junior Achievement. Yeah. Junior Achievement to teach their children about import, export, finance, you know, wholesale, retail, yeah, to how to, so, they, so the kids could run their business. Now we now it's a program in schools called Junior Achievement with no connection to that agrarian age. Operation Hope was created after the Rodney King riots because I realized, I realized that urban black and brown people never got the memo on free enterprise. So I decided that we had to solve both the both the the the, the, the aspirational depression on the right side of the brain where creativity and hope lives because that with PTSD after 40 years being told you ain't nothing, you believe it. So we had to solve that, get you to believe again, and then get you then, the, then once you believe, get your credit score up, get you in the economy, make you a homeowner, entrepreneur, small business owner. So we had to create that ladder of opportunity. That's why I created Operation Hope. So it's both, and now we're, we're gonna be pounding on policy as sort of the next level of this movement. Yeah. So it's both generational, well, it's, it's, it's systemic, that then created generational wealth. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. I, I love what Jane Barrett, she's the chief advocacy officer for NX, and just a really good friend of mine. You know, she just gave you a high five in the comments. Financial literacy is a human right. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't embrace that more. John, let's, let's quickly shift over to small business um, owners and correct me if I get my stats wrong. Um, my understanding is within the African American community, there's about 2 million small business owners in the U S um, they account the population wise, African American, American, African American community is about 13%. But when it comes to being a small business owner, you're only looking at about 7%. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously there's a lot of Hispanic business owners too. Um, and something like 4.4 million of them, um, 30, 30 million small businesses in the U S we're, we're in the main minority small businesses, boom. 30 million. And um, and most uh, uh, businesses in the U.S. have have a million dollars of revenue or less. That's all of them. Yeah. Um, twenty percent of all small businesses employ twenty percent. Twenty percent of uh, of America, half of uh, small businesses employ half of America, and most eighty percent of black businesses are one of four employees, typically one. 
So it's mostly a self-employment project, which is why we were not getting this, the PPP funds, uh, the CARE Act funds, the, the, the why we weren't accessing these funds from Congress is approved on the, on the other side of COVID. Was it saying we're good at the business, the busyness part of it? Like I'm a plumber, I'll come do your plumbing. I'm an electrician, I'll come fix your your, your, your electrical short. We're really brilliant at what we do, graphic artists or whatever. But the business side, so the busyness side, we're good at. The business side, the business management office, the finance office, the accounting office, the 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 ability to do the paperwork, right? That part we're not good at because once again, we never got the memo on free enterprise or how to run a business. So when and we don't trust government and we don't trust banks for the reasons I've already articulated. Yeah. So that's just a that's just a a, a perfect storm uh, and a black swan and a train wreck all in one. And, and one of the reasons why when this money came out, we didn't apply for it. You you have one of my favorite phrases, and you, and and here's one reason. Here's the reason I always talk about John going to church. Um, he's got some pet phrases that are his go-to's, but they're just so. The analogies right there. One of my favorites you always say is when America has a cold, the African community has pneumonia. And man, during COVID, if there was ever a good you know analogy or a dead-on analogy, that's it. Um, it is. This has really hit the African American community hard. Besides just the small business side, we're seeing. You know, I mean, you look at the numbers in Chicago and Detroit, where I'm from. Uh, at one point in St. Louis, the only deaths were African American, and 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 really heavy on the male side too. I mean. Yeah. You know, viruses don't discriminate, uh, is what we keep saying. Um, they, don't, they don't discriminate, but they do congregate. And there and you go. Congregate in areas where you're not social distancing. Yeah. Where you have high levels of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, health disparities, where you don't have high immune systems. And where does that come from? It comes from this back. Goes back to slavery, where yeah. the slave master threw the worst part of the animal out the back door. And save the good part for his or family. We then took that that those scraps, turned them into delicacies: grits, hog maws, pig feet, chicken legs, uh, ribs. Dude, I love grits. Food. Come on, man. We call that soul food, Sam. <laughs> and Sam and you and I can eat it once a month and have a good yeah. time and go to a barbecue restaurant. But you shouldn't eat the stuff every day. Your the arteries. And we ate it every day for 300 years, and now we got obesity, hypertension, diabetes, high blood pressure. I mean, too much salt will kill you. It will literally kill you. Yeah. And so you have, we, we're walking around health time bombs um, on top of it with a disease that congregates in, in dense environments. So we're in poor neighborhoods on top of each other. And here's a, a state of honor. All viewers here need to drop to their knees tonight and thank secondary and third, third level responders, which are black and brown folks. We're out here delivering packages, stocking shelves, yeah. Uh, uh, storing, you know, allowing us to, to to be at home comfortably. These folks are out uh, out here doing this this work that is not distanced. That's allowing us to be distanced, and so they are ground zero for what's going to be, I believe, Sam, the largest group of black of of, of, hom of homicides of mortality rates in this country from this disease. Uh, is going to be Black Americans. You have the yeah. largest population of folks who did die, Black folks, and the the largest population of folks who didn't get access to capital, Black folks. It's just it's a sin, right? Yeah. And it's a perfect storm. And unfortunately, it's also math. Math, I understand. We can solve the math. Yeah, amen. Um, I I love this, and yeah, you're getting uh, we're getting all kind of love on the. I'm gonna give you one last question or one last shout out. So, uh, John has. Uh, again, serial entrepreneur. He's got Promise Homes, which I want you all to go out and take a look at, uh, and Operation Hope, because we've had a lot of questions around financial literacy. Veronica, who works with Truist, um, you know, SunTrust oh, sure. in Atlanta. A great partner of ours. Yeah, that's what I going to say. She says they have, a fa yeah, they have an amazing financial sure. literacy free movement program. Um, give us the, the, the quick 101 on Operation Hope and like partners with um, Truist or SunTrust, if you don't mind. Yeah, quick. so everybody watching your program and listening, who's in the U.S. at least, can call our 1-800 number or go online at operationhope.org or Hope Inside COVID-2019. Uh, it's Hope Inside Disaster, but Hope Inside COVID-2019 and uh, get services for free. Just go to operationhope.org and we'll pivot you from there uh, around mortgage restructuring, credit counseling, debt restructuring, budget restructuring, access to capital through the federal, these federal programs, city, state, and county programs you may not know about. 
We are your financial concierge. We are your Starbucks of financial inclusion. We are your private banker for the working man and woman. And that was founded. We have 152 locations in 22 states and growing, but it was founded uh, with Bill Rogers, then of SunTrust, who believed in what I was doing and put down the first marker for the first location. Then we got a commitment out of them to do 200 locations. And now we have commitments of 500 locations from all banks around the country. We're also now in employers. We're working with a range of employers from KKR to AT&T to UPS. I mean, it's, it's, it's exploded. And, I'm, and, and we have some big announcements coming up in the next few weeks of, me, of major new partners. And this time next week, Sam, your viewers can download Hope in Hand on, from the App Store for, for their mobile device. And we will be uh, available right on their hand, text, email, voice, and face, contacting with our coaches of Hope in Hand, powered by Hope Inside Mobile. But all that started with a vision from the South uh, from Truist Bank now, SunTrust. Uh, so here you had civil rights in the South with Dr. King, and now you've had civil rights in the South with uh, Truist and a range of others in Operation Hope. So you can see why we love John. You can also see I talked about us going to church. I had a couple people uh, tag in saying, man, love the history lesson. That was nothing, guys. I'm going to send you the links of our previous interviews with John. I do think in those, I did ask one question. Um, 45 <laughs> minutes nonstop, some some just the best interviews. It was hilarious because we were doing this with my crew from London. And, and it was just funny watching them start to take notes to watch their eyes kind of go in there. You know, they were almost, you know, giving us the whole church feel. All right, um, we are gonna send out a million links, but interviews we've done with John for Operation Hope, the partners that they have, same with Promise Homes, but folks, we are up against it. John, always, as always, thank you for coming. Everyone else, uh, be here tomorrow at 10.30 at a.m. I think that's 3.30 uh, in the afternoon in the UK. I'll be joined by Nikki Galamas from Nova Credit, the founder of that. We will see y'all tomorrow. Thanks for being here. Love me some Sam. Oh man, I still love that shirt, dude. By the way, you're, you've been, uh, how long have you been married now? You got a year going almost? Oh, come on, man. Three years. <laughs> don't, don't cut me short, man. I was uh, going to, I wanted to get you in trouble. She, you've got to be dying to get on a plane. <laughs>